Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Preacher Boys podcast. Today's episode is certainly one of the most fascinating and unexpected conversations I've had in the last four years of doing this show. And it came about from a conversation I actually had back in 2021 with a young woman named Kathy Partridge. In the episode, and you can still find it on YouTube or on streaming platforms where you'd find this podcast, we had a conversation about predatory abuse at the hands of a pastor named Timothy George. And Kathy very bravely details her story, and I encourage you to go listen to that episode before listening to this one. Now, the reason this episode is connected is several months ago, I received a package in the mail with a book and a card inside. And I receive a lot of different books from publishers and you know, authors that are, you know, think their book might be a good fit for the show. And I set this book aside and thought, okay, I'll get to this a little bit later and then received an email. And it was the third email I'd gotten from an agent that was pitching this book. And again, I got a lot of pitches, so um, I hadn't really read through this one thoroughly, but one line in particular caught my eye. In the email, it said that the book was written by a man who had heard that his father was a predator through the podcast. And that kind of caught me off guard. I opened up the package. I opened up the book. And sure enough, there was a letter from the son of Timothy George. The son's name is Ryan, and that's who the episode is with today. And I won't read the letter that Ryan wrote to me privately, but essentially what he said is, thank you for interviewing one of my dad's victims. It's helped us piece together a pattern of my dad's despicable abuse. And um, again, There's been times throughout the course of doing this show that family of abusers have reached out to me, but it's always been in a pattern of defense for the abuser. It's always been to protect the name of the family member who is mentioned on the show. And Ryan did not do that. Ryan reached out, uh, wanted to share a little bit about his personal abusive experience with his father. Uh, I soon found out after talking to Kathy and, and checking in with her that He reached out to her the day he heard the episode, uh, spoke to her lawyer, was very hands-on in trying to help Kathy and any other victims that his father might have in their pursuit of justice. And uh, I was just really taken aback by Ryan's bravery as someone who is confronting a family member in these issues, but also by his own story and his own journey growing up with a father who is uh, physically abusive to him, but sexually abusive to Uh, several women uh, that we know of at this point. And so this conversation is one that I really hope you'll listen to the entire discussion. Um, Ryan brings a lot of wisdom, a lot of value in this episode, and it's a fascinating companion piece to an interview that back in 2021, I thought was open and shut. It led to exposing more and more about uh, Ryan's father, about uh, Pastor Timothy George. And so I hope you'll listen to this episode. Uh, It's a really fascinating one. Like I said, I'm not even sure how to intro it. It's such a bizarre chain of events that have led us to this place. But I really appreciate Ryan uh, for coming on the show, for sharing so openly, and for being so gracious with his time. Uh, And I'm thankful to Kathy, uh, who I checked him with before doing this episode, uh, for allowing us to reference that past story that she already put so much bravery and time into sharing. And uh, I really hope this will send people back in time to listen to Kathy's story all over again, or for the first time if they haven't yet. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Ryan George, author of Hurt and Healed by the Church, which is available wherever you can find your books right now. Here's Ryan George. Ryan, thanks for joining me on the show. Oh man, I'm looking forward to this conversation. This conversation I was telling you off air uh, took a long time to come together because I got a copy of your book. And I get a lot of copies of books from publishers. Like just the other day, I got a random book and they sent me an email saying, oh, you might like this. So it goes on my shelf, not on my to read list. It's like my, if I run out of other books I have to read, (laughs) I'll put it here. And then like a couple months ago, I get an email from your publicist and it was like, it was like the third pitch and I had just kind of ignored the other pitches. I'm a terrible person. If you're a publicist, you reach out to me. And then like there was a line in the email that said, you know, oh, Ryan, you know, you talked about his family member, which we'll get into on the podcast. And I was like, whoa, what? So then I go back through and reread the email and I'm blown away. Go back, open up the box for the first time. I see like 
your message to me. I see like underlines in the book of things that are relevant. I was like, what in the world? So it started all this in motion. I was like, <laughs> let's, let's make this conversation happen. Cause it went from like a cold pitch to like, oh, there's like, a real connection here, which is interesting. And we can get into that in a minute, but first sure. and foremost, um, take me back just to like your earliest memories within the church. Like what did the church mean to you growing up? Yeah. So the, my parents joined the IFB movement, uh, when I was about two years old. So I don't have a lot of recollections before that. Uh, but when I was four years old, we had a vacation Bible school with a live sheep and I raised my hand and got dunked. And from that age until after I was married, I was part of that IFB movement. Very, as you know, as well as anybody, very high control, very uh, superstitious. Like God was super angry and we had to do things to appease him, you know, type yeah. of thing. Um, you know, for at least four church services a week. Uh, my dad became my pastor when I was about seven years old and then uh, started a church when I was maybe nine or 10, I'd have to go back. I think it was nine years old when he started his own IFB church on an island in Chesapeake Bay. And so that was my whole life. Like I tithe to my dad, which is a really weird sentence to say, right? Yeah, Served in the right. church four services a week. And then I left for a Christian college. That was even more. It was eight uh, church and chapel services a week, plus two Bible classes, plus four required Bible studies a week, plus no spring break. Cause our spring break was turned into 15 sermons uh, called Bible conference. So I just inundated with the IFB way of seeing the world um, until I got married. I married out of it. <laughs> my wife was not part of it. She was a missionary kid, ended up at my college because it was a safe place to drop her for her parents while they were sure. abroad. Uh, after we got married, it was like, yeah, this isn't sustainable. <laughs> yeah. And when we moved to Virginia here, I live in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, and when we moved here, it was a good clean break to start looking for a different church, a different expression of faith. This is the 10,000 foot view of you. And the link to this show is because I interviewed um, Kathy Partridge on the show. People can go back and listen to that episode. And we actually had a conversation on the show about your father. And um, you mentioned in your book that you were on vacation with your wife. You get home, you find out that this episode drops about your dad, like, just walk me through, like hearing that information, sitting down and actually listening to what's being said and what levels of it surprised you versus, you know, oh, I kind of knew this or, oh, I knew this, it shaded it in a different way for me. Like, what was the mm -hmm. kind of experience of hearing that kind of information in that way for the first time? Yeah. So first I just want to tell you, like, I'm grateful that you had that conversation. I'm, that's not the way I would have liked to have found out about that stuff about my dad, sure. obviously, yeah. but I was grateful for it. Um, uh, I watched it the night on YouTube, the night it came out. Like mm -hmm. I, I'd never, I'd follow, I think I followed you online. I know I followed like bad sermons and several you yeah. know, similar accounts online. Um, and they had not featured my dad. Uh, but yeah, hearing the details of that story, um, it was a gut punch in that I felt so bad for Kathy. Hmm. It was not a surprise. Um, as you find out in my book, like it, that episode actually put together a whole bunch of pieces that we had around the edges to go, oh, that's what was going on. Because my dad had been covering it up for 20 years, the excuses that we got, the explanations. And then what it started to open up is a whole lot of mysteries well before Kathy came into our lives. Um, no. it, it was eye opening and, but it also, um, it was confirmation to go. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Now all this stuff makes sense. And, and for me specifically, so one of my dad's other victims had confided in my wife and I, we had gone and confronted my dad, uh, back in 2012. And then again, in 2019, in 2019, she finally told her family hmm. and then she told my family what had happened. Uh, I had told her back in 2012, I said, listen, I, I won't tell anybody until you're ready. Like I understand when you're on the other end of that trauma, right. like you get to control the narrative. And it was so hard for me, you know, seven Christmases in a row going home to family Christmas and my dad's acting like nothing had ever happened. And one of those uh, Christmases, some all kinds of people flow through my parents' house. Cause as a pastor and a missus, like you've got kids and families and we had six of us plus all of our spouses, plus all the friends, whatever. 
And our last family Christmas, my dad was grooming a nine and 11 year old that were there talking about how mm. women in Song of Solomon were praised for their body parts. And my wife's like, wait, what? <laughs> like she was in yeah. the next room over. And when she confronted the parents of those, those little girls, uh, they didn't believe it because they hadn't heard anything else. They didn't know the stuff that we knew. Yeah. And so when, when uh, the Ruthie in my book, when she went and told my family and her family, people believed her story, but like nothing changed around my dad. And they, they told me and my wife that we weren't forgiving. They told Ruthie she wasn't forgiving, et cetera. And so when your episode dropped, what it said was, look, we're, we're not making this stuff up. Yeah, he, right. he is who we say he is. And in some ways, um, many of the grotesque details that Kathy explained matched one for one with what we'd heard uh, from Ruthie. And so, yeah, in some ways it was a relief that you proved my wife and I were right, that you proved that my sure. dad's other victims weren't making it up. It's like a something you want to be proved wrong, but when the evidence is there, it's it's yeah i hate that that's true sure. like i don't yeah. like the truth but I, I prefer the truth over hiding yeah. what's the phrase that's been going around a lot in in our circles it's like if it can be destroyed destroyed by the truth it should be <laughs> yeah yeah that's a great that's a great quote um yeah i'm i'm curious then like this is a lot to process obviously and it's a lot to kind of work through and you know i've seen versions of this story that don't end with the family, you know, standing by the victims or caring about the victims. And I'm sure you've seen that story play out many times. And so once you receive this information, like you've got a big decision to make, which is well, a lot of big decisions to make, which is, right. you know, how do I engage with this? Like, do I talk to the person? Like, and obviously you mentioned your book, you do talk to Kathy, um, directly after this, like, what was that conversation like? Like, and how much of a, how much did you know her before hearing that episode? Like, did you have a close relationship in the past? Was it someone you kind of tangentially, you know, kind of knew, like, what was the connection there? Yeah. She come into my dad's church right about the time when I left for college. So I would see her in the summers, you know, when I came home from college. My dad helped her and her sister. Uh, he helped them out financially to do their first music album together. And they hung out with my sisters all the time. Like they were at our house. They went, even went on vacation. I remember one vacation near the end of college, we rented a jet ski together, Kathy and I, like, cause I had the money to do it. <laughs> uh, sure. I was old enough to rent the jet ski. So like I had been around them. I, I don't know that I would have called them like close friends or anything. They were very close with my sisters uh, up until uh, we left that whole, my parents left that whole area and, and moved away. So I, I knew that, uh, that night I stayed up to, I don't know, three in the morning writing and rewriting a message to her. I sent it to her on Facebook messenger. And I say, listen, man, I, I had no idea. My dad told me he had an affair with a college student. Um, I, it didn't click for me that, 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 that was not consensual or that it started before you were 19 or, or 18 or any of that. Like I, I just thought it was my dad had a problem. And then that eventuated in other problems down the line. Um, and I told her, I said, I'll help you any way I can. Like, I'm not against putting my dad behind bars. I've spoken with uh, police detectives. Uh, I told her I I'll help any way I can. And she asked, she said, Hey, would you talk to my attorney? And the next day after your podcast came out, I was on the phone with her attorney and I was trying to help any way I can. Um, we were up against Maryland statute of limitations. We didn't have a lot of time left. Uh, I told him everything I knew and he he looked at me well on the phone. He said to me, "Man, your dad was slick," and he had just just dejected. Like I didn't have, I wanted to give him more than I could, but I, you know, I was living in Indiana at the time of all, most of what happened to her, or I was down at college, so I, I don't even know the full extent. And the most damning thing about that interview that you had with her was that when she went to tell my mom, with her mom, my mom said, "Oh, not again," and that means that it probably explained why we moved around a lot as a kid. We went to a small IFB school up in Pennsylvania and my parents were half of the school teachers of this Christian school. We had four whole teachers for our school in the middle of a school day in November. We just up and left and moved to another state. And that church paid my dad for like a year, year and a half to get a church started somewhere else. And we left Tennessee under weird circumstances. Like there was, there, my dad had stories for it all, but it just didn't make sense, you know, 
And so now I don't know how much of my childhood, the narrative of what I was told about it is true. Do you feel like you have any, I mean, obviously I have more clarity now, but you mentioned like, obviously he had mentioned he had an affair um, and that's kind of how it was framed. W- was this the first time that you were like confirmed, like, oh, these are minors, like these are underage girls or was the, the first person you mentioned was the first? Yeah, the 2012. Yeah. So my wife, she leads missions trips to Nicaragua where we work with women coming out of the sex trade. And just in case that's triggering, they have these pre-trip meetings like, hey, if you have any as- assaults or molestation or anything in your background, we'd like to work with you now with a counselor or with our pastoral staff or what have you to prepare you or to recommend not going, you know? Um, and in one of those meetings, one of Kathy's other friends, one of my sister's other friends uh, who had moved down here uh, had said, yeah, Pastor George back in whatever. And that incident would have been probably a year, year and a half after what Kathy described. And so, um, yeah, so we thought that that girl was the first underage girl. And now we don't know. So in my mind, the way it looked is my dad had an affair and then he just kept working younger, you know? And so I don't, I'm embarrassed to say it took 20 years or however long between when my dad told me he had an affair to your episode where I went, oh, wait a second, that it could have been, <laughs> it could have been predation this whole time. And, and then the question everywhere else we'd been. Just scope wise. And obviously, like you said, you're trying to catch up to the statute of limitations with all these stories because it seems like that first story would have missed the mark. Kathy's story was cutting right on the edge of it. Like, I mean, are there any of these stories that you know of that fall within that? Do you know how many there are? Or is it just those few that you mentioned? Like, do you have a better idea of the scale at this point, even beyond that, that episode releasing? Uh, we don't know the full scale. We know there's more. First of all, because my mom said, oh, not again. Another one was um, in 1997, 8, 9, somewhere in there. I was home from college. And my dad was really big into door-to-door canvassing neighborhoods on our island. And my mom and I were visiting a neighborhood new to us. And we're like, hey, if you don't have a faith, you don't have a church, we'd love to invite you to ours. And the lady said, well, what church you go to? And we told her, and she said, oh, I would never go there. The pastor there is having an affair. And my mom says, like, I'm married to the guy. Like, I would know. And this stranger, I don't know who she is, still don't know who she is. My mom didn't know who she was. She looked through the screen door and she said, well, ma'am, you just don't know your husband. And so was that an affair or was that what my dad called an affair with Kathy? Was that like, man, when we lived in Tennessee, so my dad uh, went to Tennessee Temple University in Chattanooga and my mom is a professional seamstress and she's like sewing the college girls dresses. We had college kids in our house all the time. My babies, like there were girls in our house all the time. My dad had a 3.9 GPA and we up and moved away because he said, I just don't want to take Greek and Hebrew. I want to get into ministry in a hurry you know, sold his business. He built up, started a business while we were there, sold it, gave the money to his dad, moved to Pennsylvania. And like, there's so many questions now, like which, which of the girls in Pennsylvania, which of my friends and my dad do stuff with, you know, and are there more in between? Like, we just don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a scary thing. And it's, um, you know, it took me back in your book, just the thought, but you mentioned the letter that was written, which I covered on the episode. And, um, you know, you mentioned it's on the same paper he would write his sermons on, like the same type of paper and like that kind of stuff. That duplicity is, has to be a lot to grapple with. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm just curious before diving a little bit into your, your background some more, um, you mentioned he moved around a lot, you know, given money to go start a new church. How many people on the ministry side do you think were aware Like, do you think they were all fooled too? Or do you think it was a, because that's, that's always the argument is like, is there a systemic cover up of these things? Or do you think it was just, he was pulling the wool over everybody's eyes? I've asked myself that question multiple times because I was seven when we left Pennsylvania or eight, nine, somewhere like that. I was five or six when we left Tennessee. I I don't know. I don't know. It wouldn't, let me put it this way. I wouldn't be surprised if that was going away money, like make the problem go away money. I also wouldn't be surprised if he had thoroughly convinced them, right? Like I I wouldn't be shocked either way. My dad, before he, and what he would say before he became a Christian uh, was a poker shark. And he, he is good at it. I saw him for the first time this weekend in four years. My grandma passed and went up for a memorial. 
and he's in the room there. And my, my dad came up to me like nothing had ever happened ever. Like I never written a book. Like it was so unnerving. It, it's kind of like when Trump walks out after the court case and you, we all know from live reporting what was actually said in there. And then he tells you it's the exact opposite of what was said in there. You know, it was like, I don't know what reality you're living in right now. You're asking me questions about my motorcycle. Like, I don't, it was so weird. And so I don't know. My, my dad copped to the fact that he never confessed to anybody. He, he told me that he said, I've never, but that doesn't mean that people didn't know. Right. Like, does that mean someone told their dad or, you know, even, even healthier churches than what you and I grew up in make mistakes on reporting that, I mean, that's grievous mistakes. Uh, but yeah, I just don't even know. No. And has, has he ever admitted it to you or is he just play it as if nothing happened or. So he will admit things happened. He likes to reframe the words we use around it. Yeah. Um, I started recording almost every confrontational conversation with him in 2012. Um, so I have, they're up on Dropbox. I did that for my family so that when Ruthie was finally willing to talk about it, we would have this treasure trove of like, here's all the things that dad's been saying. So like, if you don't believe me, so dad will say, well, sometimes they'll say they're making it up or they're reframing it. In one conversation uh, I had, I actually went with one of the victims to dad and he remembered things she didn't. And didn't remember things she did. So who knows? Like, yeah, I don't even know. Yeah. Well, going going back to your um, your childhood because you you touch on this in the book, and you share a little bit about your experience with him before any of this. Like all of these things, all of the, all these kind of bombshell revelations later on. He wasn't the easiest person to be around, you know, as a kid <laughs> on on any other level. And, um, I, I wanted to ask you this because I read a book by Reza Aslan about God. And one of the things he said that has stuck with me from the minute I read it, and I think about it all the time is he said, when you ask a child to draw a picture of God, they basically draw their dad. They draw like a superhuman version of, of their dad. And there's this notion that, you know, how you view your father really paints how you view the God that you believe in. And I think that's doubly so if your dad is also the spiritual leader, the pastor in the church. Right. So growing up, what was your view of your dad? And in tandem with that, how did that shape your view of who God was? Well, you can understand why I was scared of God because my dad beat me. My dad hung me. My dad one time uh, to quote unquote, cool off discipline, put me in minus 32 degree Fahrenheit weather where I wrapped myself in carpet padding to avoid exposure. Uh, threw me, threatened to knock my teeth out, but then would do like the spiritual end of that abuse where he would say, hey, in the Old Testament, when you disrespected your parents, you were publicly stoned. So you should be grateful you're alive. <laughs> so I ran away a lot. I, I, I Probably once a year, I ran away. Uh, I remember one night I almost got shot. I walked 12 miles to my buddy's house and uh, you know, I look like an intruder walking up at two in the morning by the time I finally got there. And he's like, man, it's a good thing I recognize you because I had the gun ready to go. Um, which also speaks to the kind of people in my church, I guess. But uh, yeah, I was scared all the time. And like you did, you, you just tried to keep dad happy. Right. And, and so it makes sense that I was somewhat comfortable in my faith. I had fewer questions about my faith until after I left because I just assumed, well, God, the father is like my dad. <laughs> right. And and I know your dad became a pastor when you were seven. So you've got a, you know, you have limited memory of time before that, if any. Did you notice or do you believe there was a shift from pre seven to, oh, now he's got a little bit more power and control? Was there a shift in personality or was it something mm -hmm. where, you know, he was always kind of that way and he just found a great excuse to, exhibit those traits in a public way? Like, do you, do you remember a time prior to him acting in that way? Yeah. I gave a story in the last chapter of the book where I talk about my dad was actually the opposite of that until, uh, they wanted to start homeschooling me. So I was in Christian school through seventh grade, a really tiny IFB schools for years. Um, and when that shifted, we came home and, and right at that time I surpassed my dad in height. 
And I remember it was his 40th birthday. And we, he's like, I can still outrun you. You might be taller. Like he was so insecure. He's like, but I can still outrun you. So we got the family out in the driveway and we did a race and I smoked his ass. I mean, I just like crushed him. And from that moment on and from pushing back, I didn't want to be homeschooled. I love the competitiveness of school. Um, I was valedictorian in my class. I love competing against other. And so that's when we started butt heads. Um, and so they made me out to be the problem child, right? Like my dad didn't physically abuse my siblings. There was some verbal abuse, a little bit of spiritual abuse, but nothing like what he lavished on me. And they're like, you're getting this because you deserve this. Like you earned this. In fact, uh, when we adopted our daughter in 2021, it was two months after your episode came out. I wrote a blog post and I'd been editing it for weeks about how I overcame my fear of being a dad and finally succumbed to it at 40, whatever years old to become a dad. And, um, I, I put in there, you know, this is some of the things my dad did to me. This is why I was scared. This is generational. This goes back generations in my family. And my mom got on the phone with my sister three times, told her Ryan deserved to be abused because he's telling his story now. Ryan deserved to be abused because he's telling his story now. Um, which just reinforced it, right? That I was the problem, not dad, right? But I was, I was the one who caused it. And so in my dad's mind, Kathy is the problem. Ruthie is the problem. These college girls are a problem. The girls swimming in my pool are a problem. It's never his problem, if that makes sense. It's kind of the chicken and the egg thing that I try to, and, and it's interesting. Like, I, I don't know if you've read Jimmy Hinton's stuff at all. Um, mm. I, I think you'd really resonate with his. So Jimmy is a pastor in, of a church of Christ um, church, and he actually turned his father in and his father was mm. in prison. And so he talks about like writing letters back and forth to his dad and like trying to determine like disentangling what's lies, what's truth. Is he playing a game right now? Is this, and, um, but it's really fascinating to me having conversations with him or, or with people in your position where it's like, okay, the theology in fundamentalism is super toxic and harmful. And it's, right all the things that we've described in the past on the show. But then you see these guys in these positions and you always go, well, were they drawn to this theology because they were abusive and harmful and toxic? Or did they truly embrace the theology and it made them toxic and abusive and harmful? Like, mm. um, so I'm just, I'm just always curious. Like, do you look at your dad in some ways as a product of a system? Or do you look at him as like, that was his outlet to go, Hey, I already have these traits. This world makes a lot of sense, you know? Mm -hmm. Cause I know you mentioned the book, like he was Catholic and then he pivoted into it and it caused a lot of stress between him and his dad. Like mm -hmm. his dad saw some things he didn't like. So I'm, I'm curious, like what you think of the spiritual side or did he, did he believe it at all? <laughs> you know, that's the other thing I always wonder is like, was it just a coat of paint or is it something you actually really felt like this is the right way to go. I don't know. Like, that's the thing is like, I didn't get to observe. I think now it would be so much cooler if I could go back to 1980 sure. and watch and watch it to, to, to observe. Um, but I do think my dad is a true believer in the IFB system. Like, okay. I think he believes the theology through and through. I don't know if it was when he got to Bible college or his first time being an assistant pastor that he figured out, Oh, this system's going to work for me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, my, my dad has taken advantage of every situation he could business. I mean, every business he's touched, he's built. Right. And he comes from an entrepreneurial family. Uh, one of my cousins by 28 years old was worth $50 million. Like, wow. he, like of his own, like not Nepo baby, like created his own business. Like th all of my uncles, his dad, they all, in fact, my dad was in business with my grandfather before he left to go to Bible college. So I, I don't know, hmm. but I, I think he saw this fits how I'm wired and I can run with this. Yeah. I always bristle against when stuff like the Josh Duggar story breaks or, you know, any, any stories like these come out and people go, oh, well, that movement, you know, creates abusers. And I agree in terms, <laughs> in certain terms with that sentiment. But I also go like, 
well, I was raised in that environment and you know, I, yeah, I, definitely I didn't become think, one. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. And like there's 18 of 19 kids and counting did not, you know, as far as we know. So it, it's, but on the flip side too, it is conducive to abusive behavior. And I think that if you take some things to their logical extent or to their extremes, which most people don't, you're going to be a fairly abusive person, you know, if not, I mean, not necessarily in a pedophilic way, but just in the way that you view women or treat other people or, or you know, discipline in your household. Like, which those was the things- point of my book, right? To say, like, so many of the problems in my family and in the families in IFB churches are actually theology problems. Like, when you can use your God to back up this malignant behavior, well, of course, you're going to, you're, like you said, it incentivizes you to do malignant behavior. Right. Well, and again, you're, you're really creating a God in your image of, you know, he's a domineering, spiteful father figure, you know, which is the way he's really presented racist, in name it. most IFB churches. Um, so you mentioned your book, you spent 20 years in that environment. You spent 20 years out. Um, you know, what, what were some of the biggest things now because hindsight is 2020 right like i used to always ask what's the first red flags you noticed in your (laughs) denomination in your church but the truth is that's not super helpful because the first red flag you notice is not the first one you should have noticed so oh looking look looking back with hindsight being 2020 like what are some of the key things that you look at just in the system you were raised in where you go like that just wasn't cool like that's something that I wish somebody would have noticed. I wish I would have noticed way early on, like, hey, this theology is really poison to our family and to my own soul, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I think the glorification of anger is such a huge thing. Like, I don't, I can't tell you how many IFB pastors I saw in college because we had, you know, three a week that were paraded through our chapels and church services times four years plus all the churches. So my dad, uh, up until COVID, uh, performed what's called a pulpit helps ministry. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but like small churches that don't have a pastoral staff when the pastor goes on vacation, uh, they have an opening. And so they have itinerant pastors fill that position. So when my dad stepped down from his church because of the Kathy situation, that's what he went into. So there's a ton of pastors that I've been introduced to, and I can't tell you how many of them were just torqued off all the time. And it was considered like holier like they were anointed because they were angry. They were spitting. They were sweating. They were, you know, uh, my sister's church. She still goes to IFB church. And the pastor gets up during 2020 and like rips government papers apart on a live stream and just, just goes off. Um, as like, this is, this matches everything that I'm seeing on bad sermons, the Instagram account. I'm like, yep, this is, everybody is torqued off. And they want to go back to when Jesus flipped some tables in the temple. The problem with that is the Romans road that IFP people taught me starts with there's none righteous, no, not one. So there's only one person. If if you believe that Jesus is righteous, he's the only righteous person that you can say had the right to be angry. Also, this was the exception, not the rule. And if he really was trying to like take people out, he would have just Thanos snapped and everybody was gone. Like he never turned around to the disciples and said, go and do likewise. He never said, hey, why don't you make some whips and come in here and do this with me? It was just him. And so actually see the thing in the temple as how meek Jesus was, not how angry he was. It just seems like that whole movement is built on anger. You know, Bill Gothard had a really calm voice, but if you look at the language of it, it was an angry language, right? It was, it was a bullying was built into the system. And so then everything else flows out of that. Once you're a bully and it's coercive, well, of course you're going to treat women as second class citizens. Of course you're going to be people of color the last time my dad was ever in my house, he said something horrifically racist. And I was like, dude, I have a black daughter. Like, no, like we're not going to do this. This is not how this goes down. Right. But he had theology to back it up in his mind. Right. He had theology for how he engaged with the government. He had theology for all these things. It was like, I remember this, you might find this funny. We had a guy, my dad got upset. He let him teach Sunday school at his church. And he quoted some verse from like Isaiah or Ezekiel or somewhere where it says, do not bow down to the tree with golden bulbs and lay gifts for that as an idol. And the guy got up. He's like, see, this is why we shouldn't celebrate with Christmas trees. This is why we shouldn't give gifts and put gifts under Christmas. I was like, you can proof text your way into any misogynistic or legalistic or whatever. Yeah. It's just so everything is built. You said it really well earlier. They built their religion in their own image. 
one of the phrases I said in the book was like, you shop for the church that hates the same thing you do because all Sunday is, is a, Hey, let's talk about something that we all hate. No, the phrase they always said in our church was the evangelist job is to, is to blow in, blow up and blow out. <laughs> like oh, that. Wow. Was the, I love that. That was the, uh, so you, you come storming in, you can talk about the stuff your pastor doesn't usually talk about or, or talk about it in a way that's 10 times harder. Um, my favorite was when guest speakers would come in and preach for like 45 minutes or an hour screaming about like doing extra things for your pastor. And they're like, your pastor won't <laughs> tell you this, but I'm going to tell you. And you're like, you just picture the pastor slipping him a 20 on the way out. Like, Thanks. You know, but yeah, it was a it good, was, good cop, bad cop routine. Right. Right. And, or bad cop and slightly more bad cop, you know, depending yeah. where you're at. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it, anger was the one emotion that men were allowed to express that was considered healthy was, hmm. you know, like I mean, tears were okay if you're talking about your salvation story, but that's pretty much the only context it was. It was, it was anger, like anger, you know, anger at sin, anger at people that do sin, anger at people that, you know, and it like, it was just anger all the time was like the, and, and if you expressed anything else, like you were, you were, met with a lot of anger <laughs> from from the people above you or called um, gay or called uh, effeminate or called any number of oh my god yeah i was i was all the time was was talked about oh you're so emotional oh you're this you're so and and it's and i am a more emotional person but i also don't i don't <laughs> i don't put that equal to being like in a in a negative position i don't make that like a weakness you know like i i think there's definitely there's definitely times it can be depending on if you don't know how to process it mm -hmm. but that again that's where like your religious environment wasn't giving you the tools to process those things it was just don't do that well and counselors really will tell you that anger is almost always a secondary emotion right it's it's how we process embarrassment it's how we process insecurity it's how we process fear even you know look at hitler or whatever it's how we process, there's a whole list of things that lead to, it's been interesting. Uh, I didn't put the full report in my book, but um, social scientists have been putting people in fMRI machines and showing different images and measuring where it goes in the brain. And religious conservatives uh, light up the most in the part of the brain that uh, signals disgust. And so uh, it makes sense that disgust is one of the things that leads to anger. You're, you get so disgusted. And in some ways, that's a good thing, right? If it leads us to justice, to seek out the betterment of our neighbors. Uh, but that's not where, it, as you know, better than probably anybody, it's not where it leads most of the IFB movement. Well, that's the funny thing about the flipping example is like, even in that story, I think pastors put themselves in the place of Jesus, which they do in most <laughs> sermons. Uh, they right. put themselves in his position. But if you look at the people that Jesus was flipping tables because of, it was the religious leaders. So if you're going to put mm -hmm. yourself in the story, it's probably there. And then when you look at the example of, and I know the pastor you're talking about, ripping up papers, you know, during the COVID, you know, pandemic. And, but you look at that story, regardless of what you think about any of that, because I don't want to, you know, sidetrack everything there, but it's like you look at the response to the government that IFB pastors take and they take the flipping tables approach. But like, if you look at how Jesus interacted with the government that was literally coming to crucify them, one of his disciples slices off their ear, right. he heals them really quick and then lets them continue with what they're doing. And it's just, again, and says to Peter, what are you doing? Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, get behind yeah, like, me, get in line, you know? And um, yeah, it's, it's just really interesting. And it's, it's a, from the theology perspective, especially now as somebody who I would put myself in a I don't know category in relation to a lot of this, I just find myself almost in theological debates with people that <laughs> like hold to a theology that I don't. But it's like, even in your own scriptures, this does not line up with what your savior teaches, which is a really, it's just a weird conversation to have to have where it's like, you're not even understanding this book that you've been preaching for like 30 years. It's a really, really odd. It spot. had a change. A lot of that had to change for me. I can't remember the, the social scientist who came up with this idea, but she said, you can tell where someone's trauma is uh, by to which part of the Trinity they pray to. And I always found out I was praying to Jesus and that makes sense. Right. And it was a huge breakthrough moment when I read where Jesus said, Hey, if you've seen me, you've seen my dad. <laughs> 
I was like, oh, how do I reconcile these? And so I had to get more and more distance from my biological father to fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus because those two things. Now, eventually I was able to see, I can tell you the trail I was on, what mountain I was on when I was finally able to even listen to like Chris Tomlin's good, good father. Like I, I remember I just didn't even have a category for that. One of the elderly guys, I have a guy in my Bible study, 70 some years old and he gave me a book, no longer an angry God. And it was, it broke like so many lines and you go, yeah, that's not who Jesus is. Like that's not who his father is. And so I had to fall further and further from the God I was taught in order to fall in love with Jesus. Well, I asked you at the near the beginning of the episode, like if you're viewing God through the lens of your father, which I think is our default as kids, mm-hmm. you know, we just draw our dad with a longer beard, you know, or <laughs> if you didn't have one. Um, you know, and how that painted it. I guess now, twenty years out, you know, what does your view of God look like now? And have you fully divorced it from the view you have of your father, which isn't incredibly healthy. Oh, a hundred percent divorced from that. Um, I was talking to my therapist a few weeks ago and I said, I think my securest attachment right now is when I'm in prayer. Um, and I've, I've had to intentionally, I don't know how the Trinity works. I'm still figuring all that stuff out, but like I've had to intentionally talk to all three of them because it's so hard, but you know, the, I keep going back to Jesus saying it's better for someone to be thrown in the lake with a millstone around their neck than it is to harm a child. And I just know that the way, the way of our religion that we both grew up in, how it treats children lets me know that that's not the heart of Jesus. So let, we'll start there. You know, my wife, she's the missions director at our church. The stuff that we see on the mission field, the stuff that she saw on the mission field, mission field schools are rampant with this stuff. Like it's not just IFB, obviously, but I've, I've had to, f- I've had to fall more and more in love with the winsome Jesus. When I look at the New Testament, every spectrum, old and young, male and female, Jew and Greek, uh, government, not government, religious, not every spectrum, end of every spectrum was intrigued by that guy. They were drawn to him. And there's a verse in there that says it wasn't because he was like physically attractive. Like he was just so countercultural. There was something about him that everybody felt comfortable in his care. Well, nobody feels comfortable in my dad's care. So that was really easy to separate those two things. And in moments where I, where I can see a difference, okay, this is a safe moment, this is a secure moment, or this is something that makes me feel afraid or insecure or worrisome, I can, it's really easy now for me. I have, it's almost binary for me to be able to tell where Jesus is working and where he's not, because I definitely know where he's not. Yeah, I was fascinated by this part of your book, and, and I'll, I'll be 100% transparent. Like I was reading, um, when I first got your book and I, I read the title, I was like, hurt by the church and then healed by the church. And I was like, what's the angle on this going to be? Like, Cause <laughs> you know, look, I read, I've read some books, you know, recently where, you know, they'll like, I read Ginger Duggar's book, you know, oh, and it was okay. like, uh, you know, I'm not deconstructing, I'm disentangling. And it's like, it, it's, it was basically like, and here's you end up in MacArthur's church. Way to you go. know, yeah. Here's, here's some, here's like three or four pages about things that are, bad and like the rest is just like a slightly altered version of that here that you can have and and i was i wasn't sure because i don't know you so i wasn't like where's this gonna go and obviously you know i'm not i'm not in a camp that where i i lean into that stuff so like i I was reading it from a perspective that's not as you know probably not as charitable as one should be going into a book but i was pleasantly surprised by the way that you described your experience and pursuit and you kind of mentioned it here um i i guess i'm i guess i'm curious like digging deeper into what you just said which is discovering jesus unlike that in that denomination we can go as deep into this as you want but i guess why do you think that you were predisposed to pursue the the figure of jesus because you were raised to pursue that version of God? Um, or was it something where you feel like you kind of wiped the slate clean as best as you could? And then we're like starting from scratch. Cause like, I always question that too, right? Like I, um, I talk about like the default hum of my operating system leans into, you know, when I see creation, 
I look at it as creation. Or when I see a tree, I think like, oh, it was designed. Or when I when I do something bad, I think, oh, I'm going to hell. Like that default operating system is there because from the time I was like a little kid, I was taught this way of thinking. Yeah, it's and how so you're programmed. It, it's hard to be objective in your pursuit of what God is or what the whether that's a who, a what, a whatever that looks like in your life. Like it is informed so much by how you were raised to perceive it. So mm-hmm. I guess I, I guess why did you center around the figure of Jesus versus like what some do, which is, you know, end up in different religions, end up non religious, end up going, Oh, I don't need a God figure. Like how do you feel you did that search in a way that was like helpful and not just let me clean out like, oh, I can't go to movies <laughs> like some do. That, <laughs> like, I'll be like a little bit edgier version of what I was. Yeah, which is a lot of non-denominational churches, right? Um, yeah, so th- that's the long story short is I'm in a non-denominational church. I've been serving there for 18 years. I started coming to it every week to prove it was wrong. And what was fascinating, and this part might intrigue you. So my pastor has a doctor, but he's an adrenaline junkie. He's climbed the highest summits on two continents. He's like, all the crazy things. I have a pastor who is a whitewater paddler and ice climber, one who races motorcycles, one who flies experimental aircraft. Um, but anyway, he got his master's in experiential education where he would take people out into the wilderness and you go through some really challenging thing. And then he would leave you with a journal for anywhere from one to three days and you would process it and you go, okay, I just learned that something in my life was arbitrary line between I can't and I can or I never thought I would, and I just did, or something like that. What's something back home in your life that is super hard or challenging or whatever that now you know that line is arbitrary? And so he approached his faith that way, which made it an adventure. Like, hey, let's explore. When we have a question, let's unpack that. Well, then he went and got his doctorate in ethnography where he studies subcultures. Um, And it was really cool. He took a group of people in our area. I'm a highly church Bible belt over 200 Baptist churches in our phone book when I moved here. And he said, hey, I need you to find people who don't go to church, won't go to church. I just need them for a scientific study to get my doctorate. Secular school, you know, uh, at the time, or maybe that was his master's anyway. And so what he did was he interviewed people. He's like, why don't, why don't you buy into church? Why don't you buy into Jesus and God or whatever? And he said, most of the things that those people told me were not objective problems. Like those are really easy things to get past. <laughs> He's like, you could actually build a church that is none of those things for the most part. And so um, I remember coming into this place going, my questions are allowed. And as an adrenaline junkie, as someone who bungee jumps and jumps off buildings and base jumps and stuff like that, I know that the more afraid I am, the more adrenaline, dopamine, everything else that I get after I jump, after I do the hard thing, after I lean into the discomfort. So bringing that into the faith space, which is normative for me, uh, to go, this is uncomfortable. This is a topic I don't know. How does this tie into Jesus? Does this tie into Jesus? And to know that in this faith community, I was allowed to ask those questions. Um, I remember the first, the first one of the environments that I got into in our church, the leaders of our, not, not like someone at the table, like the people running the conversation at our table were struggling with infertility. And they're like, right now we're having a hard time believing that God is even good. And I never heard anybody in church walls say that, you know, as, you know at church. Um, and so it, what, what it creates is this freedom to say, Hey, I have a trouble with this part of the God that I was taught. I have a problem with this way that culture treats church or treats p- people who are other or whatever it is. And for people to just go, okay. I remember one time I flipped my pastor off, cussed him out. We were in the desert. We went to dinner and I got to the table and I said, uh, I named his name. I said, I don't agree with your theology today. Like the reason we got in the predicament we did is because you disobeyed the sign. It said four by fours only. And we tried to do this in a Chrysler minivan. And it took us hours to get that van out of there, building, literally building a road to get it out of a four by four trail. And he said, and then he could have, like my dad would have done, he could have bowed up. He could have, and instead he looks around the table and he goes, all right, let's talk about it. What does everybody at the table think? Like, is this a theological problem or is this just me making a mistake? You know, or was, did I lead us poorly? And if so, like, what can I learn to not do next time? What could I have, what evidence should I, all that kind of stuff. To have a faith leader be that secure, and that unintimidated by questions uh, was, it, it gave me freedom to do that, to start reading people from other religions. Uh, it's so funny. Some of my favorite books are written by atheist scientists about how detailed the design is of their subject. 
uh, the hidden life of trees. I love that book. And the guy's making fun of creationists, which fine. I was like, but you're describing a system that you said you, you actually use the word designed incredibly. I'm listening to a book right now on the senses that animals have that we don't have, like the things that they can sense that we can't. And it's not, it's not like a sixth sense, like a mystical thing. Like they physically have a sense that we don't have. And he's talking about how it's designed and all this. And I was like, you keep using the word design and then telling me I'm the crazy one. <laughs> and so, but, but the fact that my questions were allowed and encouraged, and one of the values of the faith community that I fell into uh, was that they say, hey, give, give people the gift of going second. So you can't expect anything more from your circle than what you're willing to say, your questions, your doubts, your anger, your whatever. And so falling into a faith community that I had the utter freedom to ask questions and to have doubts. And, and part of it too is me knowing, uh, I know this is kind of a long answer, but I'll, I'll wrap it here, is part of it too is me knowing that you, in order to have faith, so Old and New Testament it says the just shall live by faith. You can't have faith with certainty. You can only have faith if you're scared or worried or both, or if you have doubts, right? I'm only scared when I go out on the wings of an airplane. If I think that my chute's not going to work or my harness isn't going to stay on or the pilot's going to do something stupid. Like I, once you do, it's like the sixth time you ride a roller coaster. The first time you were white knuckling holding on. The fifth or sixth time you can pose for pictures. The roller coaster is doing the same thing. It's just that you're convinced that now it works. Your certainty has overrun your adrenal glands. And so what I've learned in my faith side of it, spiritual side, is that I have to have questions. I don't have to have a God I agree with. I don't have to have a God who fits in my box. There's more out there than I understand. And the more of the world I've seen, you know, all over these random places around the planet, literally, I've been to both polar circles, like sleeping in the snow, looking for God. He's shown me parts of himself that are 180 degrees opposed to what I grew up in. For the discomfort side, because I think a lot of times that gets weaponized, right? And in, mm. in the circles we grew up in, it was like, you know, you're tired from serving in 10 ministries. Good. You know, or, oh, this sermon made you feel <laughs> upset. Good. Or you're, you know, this book pissed you off. Good. You know, and I, I guess, I guess, and like I said, it was refreshing, I think, reading your perspective in your book, because I've read so many puff books about that exploration. Hmm. How do you determine whether something's uncomfortable? or whether something is actually harmful. Because I think sometimes people sit in the pew or sit in conversation with a spiritual leader or, you know, or on a retreat with other people from their church, and there's something that happens or there's a conversation being had that makes them feel viscerally uncomfortable in some way. Hmm. Like, what what's the process by which you test that moment to go, okay, this is a good uncomfortable, <laughs> and this is not my body and my mind telling me like, oh, you're actually in danger. Because I think some people have pushed themselves through the danger for a long time and then end up in Fully. even deeper. Um, and then other times, you know, I think people call things, you know, traumatic that are actually just uncomfortable. And I think on the other mm -hmm. side of the uncomfort, there's some good things. So how do you kind of navigate those? What's helpful? What's not? That's a challenge, right? Because I don't know that there's a hard and fast rule. Right, the fundamentalist in me would want to say, "Here's the line." Uh, you interviewed Laura Anderson. I've read her book. I've watched her stuff online. Like, yeah, sometimes your body just knows something's yeah. not right here. Right, I, I, I knew there were times when my dad went beyond just disciplined. Right, and my body, there was a frenzy there inside, and I knew I need to get out before this gets worse. Um, on the face side of it, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think having a a circle of people where you are known. And where you're free to say, um, I've logged over 200 hours of therapy. I got a visit this Thursday, actually, because of the stuff that happened with my family this weekend, meeting my dad, I've got two sessions this week. <laughs> so I, I, I can run this by someone and go, hey, is this, mm -hmm. is this trauma or is this just annoying or is this wrong or is this them trying to manipulate me to feel a certain way? So I think one of the things, and you know this from the people you've spoken to on this podcast, is one of the things IFB does is isolate you so where when you have those questions, you have nobody to tell you what you're feeling is off. Mm -hmm. Or the voices you hear are gaslighting you to tell you, no, 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 that's, you don't need to believe, you know, have faith, trust God over your body, whatever. Um, but I don't know that there's, and what it could be for you might be different for me, right? I, I, I hate to be like, it's relative, but it kind of, like yeah. even trauma is relative. 
Well, in some ways it's, it's, you know, I mean, Dr. Laura Anderson talks about this. I always want to say Dr. Laura, but it's a totally different figure. My mom was obsessed with Dr. Laura when I was a kid. Um, but I forgot all about her. Yeah. Like, yeah. Dr. Laura Anderson, and uh, who's decidedly very different. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I think of Hillary McBride, you know, they talk a lot about embodiment. And I think what you kind of touch on a little bit is like getting to know your own body and getting to learn those systems and what is what what is it actually telling you? Like mm-hmm. learning how to read yourself. And I think, you know a lot of times we're taught to silence our, our gut instinct, you know, we're taught like trust your gut with a stranger in public, but you're not taught to trust your gut in any other format. And I think I that, thought of it that way, but yeah, that bit. makes sense. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, and I, I think I definitely need to have you on for a part two, uh, for anybody listening because of my seamless editing, you have no clue. The <laughs> internet's gone out. My computer went black midway through this interview. So I'd love to have you back on um, if you're open to it and, and kind sure. of dive deeper into some of these things. But I want to I want to loop back around um, and just, you know, I, I, like I said, the relationship with your dad, like you mentioned just a couple of days ago, you're in an environment where you can't avoid it. You know, you're at a funeral, you're at a wedding, you're at a, you know, you run into these people. Um, what do boundaries look like? in that relationship because obviously it's your dad you're going to see him places you're going to have connections like what does that look like for you if you're willing to talk about it uh um, sure. you know what does that look like what does healthy boundaries look like and you know how do you grapple with the emotions you're feeling looking across the room at this person mm-hmm. who means many different things to you you know as you mm-hmm. again you you wrestle with that in your book where it's like there's things that you love, memories that you wish were the reality, mm-hmm. you know? And so how does that work for you? What, it, what do boundaries look like for you? So I'll answer that in two parts. First part is I, ha- I have a community of faith who, when I know, I've, the only two times I've seen my dad since, we, since your podcast came out uh, about him was my sister's wedding and this funeral over the last however many years that's been. Um, it's, so it's a date on the calendar that I know is coming. So I have therapy sessions in advance. I have friends in my inner circle and I'm like, Hey, you need to pray me through this. And that's what happened before this weekend. Um, the other is, um, we gave my dad a menu of ways to be in our life. And I said, if you're not willing to do these things, it's zero. Like it's no communication. It's only public things. And they were easy things. Like you need to get into therapy. You need to tell the pastors that you serve. You need to tell your pastor. You need to get into some sort of recovery, even sexual uh, anonymous, you know, like type of thing. Um, you need to apologize to some people. Like it was a really short list. It wasn't draconian. And he wrote us a letter a few weeks later. It's like, nah, I'm out. It's so like, all right, well, then you set the boundary. I didn't set the boundaries. You did. And so it takes a lot of the pressure off because that's one of the hard. We had, we had this discussion with my sisters this weekend because they have different boundaries with my dad and with my mom than I do. And I had a conversation with my dad's little brother. And I said, listen, man, I respect you wherever you're going to set yours for your family. I trust you. Like you've raised, you've raised four kids. You've got grandkids do what feels comfortable for you. I said, but these are the boundaries that my wife and I, and my brother and his wife and several others gave my dad. said, if you want to be part of our life, here's what they are. And if you're not willing to do that, I'll shake your hand at the wedding. I'll, you know, I'll walk, I'll carry something to your car so you can leave or whatever. But like, it's not a, there's no relationship here. There's no more family Christmases. There's no, none of that. There's no group text. There's no, you know what I'm saying? It's like, but what takes the pressure off is saying, we gave you the choice and you chose not to have it. And so I don't have to wonder like, was that too hard? Was that too much? Was the boundary? It was like, he set the boundaries, not me. I guess last, last question here. And like I said, I'd I'd love to regroup. Um, Do you, He's still actively, I mean, preaching, right? I mean, he's still, or is he, or you don't know? <laughs> I know he's in a church. It's a really small church. I think yeah. I visited one time. It had like 12 people in it. Gotcha. Um, his pastor found out about him because of your podcast. So thank you. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I don't, I don't know. Yeah. And hmm. at this point, like the, the churches that he's going to serve, I was like, uh, 
the information's public. Like it's right. on you at that point. Um, he's welcome at my sister's church. She goes to an IFB church. My dad goes to church with her on a regular basis from what I understand. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it was, it's, it's so it's, I just don't know. And I don't care to know. <laughs> sure. I, sure. I don't know if that sounds harsh, but it's like, I, I hope he finds peace for his soul. I hope somehow he, I, I don't think any of us are done until we're dead, but I just don't have a whole lot of hope that he's going to change. He's had right. so many opportunities and he's whiffed on all of them. Right. And it doesn't sound like he's willing to give up the, whatever little platform there is. It doesn't sound like he's willing to give that up. And, you know, cause I mean, that's a whole nother conversation is like, what does that even look like when you've done something like this, where you probably should never be in a church that has kids in it again, or, you know, probably won't. Yeah, it shouldn't be within 500 feet of the building. Way. That's how we you treat know? schools. Yeah. So it's like, it's hard to go like, what is, you know, even the word restoration, you know, it puts a pit in your stomach because of how that's been, ab- you know, abused yeah. and misused. But it's like, I think with all these stories, it's like, well, on some level, it means stepping into anonymity and really isolating yourself in a way where you don't have any kind of platform. And I think when you've got essentially a little man syndrome, like you're not willing to make that decision because like all you have is a pulpit, you know? And so even if it's 12 people or five people or, you know, it's people grasp onto that. And I, I, it's rare. I don't know that I've ever seen a story where someone's willing to step into the shadows out of, out of public view, you know? And, it's just book, a, it's um, a complicated I think thing. It's, is it Wade Mullen? The when yeah. narcissism comes to church. Oh no, that's uh, Chuck DeGroat. Chuck DeGroat, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And Chuck said in there, he goes, "I I get brought in these situations all the time, not abuse situations, but like these right. narcissistic high control, you know, Bill Hybels type, uh, James McDonald." And he said, "Most of them don't." He's like, "The statistics are really bad. Like most yeah. people don't choose health, even when there's family on the other side." Like, yeah. I, my dad was willing to hold on to that rather than a relationship with me. So I was like, okay, that's bigger for you. You, you go enjoy that. Yeah. Well, look, I appreciate you uh, coming on. I'm going to, um, I definitely want to have you on again um, sometime soon and just kind of, kind of run through some more thoughts in deeper ways. Um, uh, This episode I think is, is just really unique um, just because Obviously, the way that we connected, the way that um, you know this story intertwines with Kathy's, and and I really want people to kind of walk away like with this other layer to this story. And it's a, it's like I said, it's a really unique perspective, and it's a perspective where usually when a family member reaches out to me, it's anger or it's <laughs> you know it's uh it's uh oh they're lying, it's this, and so to have a conversation that's as transparent and open as what you have in your book and on this episode has been really appreciated by me. Um, for anybody who's listening to this episode, be sure to pick up a copy of hurt and healed by the church. Um, it's a really, really good book. Um, like really well written, uh, really raw and honest. And, um, it's, it's fantastic. It's a, it's a really, really good book. Um, you know, when I have a book that's not, I usually just go, Hey, yeah, go check it out. (laughs) This one really is, very good. I don't feel uncomfortable recommending it. It's fantastic. Um, and it gives a really open, honest look at, at your life and your experience. Mm-hmm. Um, is there anywhere else you want people to connect with you anywhere else people should go? I know the book is the big push, but yeah. But, uh, if you want to connect with me, I'm on Instagram at Ryplane. I think that's my handle on threads as well. I try not to send any traffic to Elon Musk. Uh, but, uh, and then if you want the audio or digital versions of the book, like if you want a Kindle version or whatever, you can get those at books by Ryan.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. And I'll look forward to seeing you on a future conversation. Sweet. Let's do it.